Um, this patient was in a facility and uh, had been transitioning and, and actively dying, had um, three uh, kids that were kind of scattered around. And there was minimal conversation between these families, or between the family members. But um, they were all concerned about mom dying alone, but it was like none of them could commit to being there with her. Um, the facility staff really cared about her too. The 11th hour volunteer went out and was reading cards and letters from the family and reading the Bible and, and just talking to the patient and at her bedside. And she'd always been really hard of hearing and, and couldn't see, had some visual defects and um, pretty contracted, but you know her uh, spirit was still pretty much in there. She had a little bit of dementia, but um, this 11th hour volunteer stayed by her bedside all all the better part of this day, at least half of it, and about 5.30 that afternoon, the patient um, looked up at, there was like a bathroom door at the foot of her bed, and she looked up at the door, there was a light on in there, and she said, okay, I'm ready, and then she passed away. The role that the 11th hour volunteer played, I thought was really key. That was my first experience with working with an 11th hour volunteer. My story is, um, involves the 11th hour volunteers too. Um, I had a patient recently in a facility and it was a similar situation where um, family members were estranged and, and they had been for a long time, but they still um, were very concerned about their mother and the, her dying process. And so I contacted the 11th hour volunteers and when I explained to the daughter and her husband what that would be about. You could just see the relief just wash over them and um, they were so grateful and so um, I checked in with the family a little later in the day and um, she said that her mother always found comfort in having the rosary recited and could we possibly you know um, do that. So I called again the volunteer coordinator and said if there's Anyone that you can find that will say the rosary, that would be great. And, and miraculously, I don't know how they do it, but they always <laughs> seem to find the right volunteers. Um, they found someone and she came in and she, and she did do that for, for the patient. And it was um, really a blessing. She was so appreciative. There was someone there almost all the time. So I'm really grateful that we have that to offer. At the nursing home, wherever I, where I go, all the staff now has come up with a new term for our people that we get better and discharge. They're graduates. Oh, are they graduating from hospice? Because a lot of times we get in there with these elderly folks. They're lonely. We give them lots of attention, you know, and manage their medications. Now you, you get their symptoms under control, get them eating a little better, and suddenly guess what? Grandma's not dying. <laughs> and and that, that's what they've started calling our graduates. And when I first started working in nursing, I was um, worked in the VA ICU in Durham, and there was an old hospice nurse that worked nights there with me, and um, she had one of the best things that I still carry with me to this day. She was just one of these crazy, wonderful people to work with. And she said that. She said, you know, um, we, we birth them into death just like we get birthed into life. What I find really affirming and um, rewarding is getting to see the patients in their home environment. To me that's so far different from hospital nursing. It can be sad but it's rarely ever depressing and you you walk in there and, and you see the whole person and the whole family and the pets and what's important to them and love to look through old photo albums or the um, photos around the house and and encourage them to share what's important or, or who that person really is. And you get them talking about that. Even if death has occurred, um, I will often say, what, what are your favorite memories of your mom or your dad or your brother or your spouse? And it's such a comfort when they remember the living, breathing um, person they are not the disease as they are in the hospital. It's not the gallbladder in room, whatever. You know, it's the person, the soul, the spirit, what gave them life, what continues how they live on in 
in the environment and with those that are around them. And I find it so enriching and so comforting to share those memories and such an honor to be part of that, that um, it's a beautiful thing. And as Berta said, death is part of living, just as birth is. But I have such deep admiration for the caregivers. He, he was just constantly joking. And so um, his goal before he died, and he had, a, his poor little heart was just like a baby bird thing, a sweetheart of a guy. So his end of life goal was to get his taxes done. And so literally when he got the, the email confirmation that his taxes had been accepted, I'm not kidding now, he flopped over on the bed and died. And when I went in there, here he is laying in the bed dead, and in the wastebasket next to him is his box of TurboTax software. <laughs> and, I, and I brought his wife's attention to this, and we just howled. And, but I didn't feel like it was disrespectful because Claude would have thought it was funny too. That he, that I'm like, look at what our government has done. <laughs> has killed us with taxes. No, he was going to have to pay. Yeah, I imagine he would have lasted for that. But I just thought, how poignant. <laughs>